Good evening and welcome all. Tonight's panel is going to be about the practices of dealing with difficult past experiences of NGOs. So we're going to listen to the experiences of different NGOs. And in line with these experiences, we also would like to see and assess different situations in Turkey. And especially uh, with regards to the Hrantink Foundation's project on turning into Sabat building into a memory place, a place of memory, we want to get certain discussions started here. So this is the panel. So we will proceed in English. I will speak in English and I will introduce our guests to you first. Okay, this, this panel, uh, practices of dealing with difficult pasts, experiences of NGOs, uh, we have the pleasure of two guests from two different NGOs. Um, so I'll try to introduce them to you first. Uh, the, our first speaker will be Gillian Lipman. Uh, she, she is from uh, Zahor Foundation for Social Remembrance. Gillian uh, Lipman uh, moved from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, USA, to Budapest, Hungary recently. And during her undergraduate studies at Gocher College, she studied peace studies and became a certified mediator and worked in the Baltimore schools teaching conflict resolution and social justice. And after graduating, Julian was a fellow with Repair the World where she led workshops for the Jewish community about white supremacy and anti-racism and later became an organizer for progressive causes like increase, increasing the minimum wage and helped to win the most progressive state bill for women's pay equity in the US last year. Maybe you can tell also how you managed to do that. Uh, and last year, Julian came to Budapest to study at Central European University where she received her master's study in nationalism studies and focused on Jewish victim identity as it relates to involvement in anti-racism work. And she currently works for the Zakor Foundation for Social Remembrance in Budapest, working to teach against prejudice and towards empathy using testimony in her role as coordinator of international educational programs. This move to Hungary, a country that two generations ago was a place of persecution for her family, offered a powerful way to explore her identity, positionality, and power. And she's very excited about empowering those around her to stand up where they feel most powerful. And Gillian will present about the Zahor Foundation for Social Remembrance, an educational and professional development NGO in Hungary whose mission is to raise the awareness of educators and students on issues like Jewish tradition and culture, anti-Semitism, racism, prejudice, and human rights in order to promote the development of a more humane and informed citizenry. Zahor is a partner of USC Shoah Foundation, and through this partnership, they offer primary source personal stories and other educational materials to study Jewish life before the Shoah and the universal lessons of the Holocaust. So um, maybe I'll give the floor to you before introducing you uh, so that we'll have the, uh, the connection between the bios and abstracts in your talk. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to start off um, by saying, not sure if you noticed, so my organization is called Zahor. 
Tom's is Zochrot. These are from the same root of in Hebrew. Uh, so our organization is an imperative. You shall remember. It's like a more biblical word of remembrance. And for Tom, Zochrot uh, is remembering, so in the present. So it's very uh, an interesting coincidence that we're both here working on different issues, but also with the same, same name. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about what Zachor does, um, and then I'm going to afterwards give a context about memory in Budapest and Hungary, uh, and so understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so Zachor, we work against xenophobia in all forms. Um, we are teaching about Holocaust remembrance and putting it into a context of today um, as a way to empower especially young people um, to be more involved in their society. Um, so how we began um, was as a publishing house. So we found that there were lots of survivors from the Holocaust that were wanting to share their story through oral testimony. So we began by publishing books. I have some here if you want to take a look afterwards. Um, and then after we published these, you know, we, uh, the organization was founded by educators. And so there were other educators coming and saying, this is a great oral history, so what can I do with it in the classroom? Um, so this is sort of how we got started doing educational materials for teachers. So from, as a publishing house, we published many oral histories and then grew to create workbooks and materials about these. Um, so they were able to complement the oral histories and the teachers could use them um, in their classrooms. One of the books we also made, um, our students made, it's a guidebook to Budapest. So we have students that are involved in leading some of our other programs, which I'll tell you about, and they were inspired um, and wanted to create a sort of book for people that wanted to get to know Budapest. Um, and based off of our materials and our publishing, we started developing partnerships. So we're partners with the Anne Frank House, um, we're partners with the Poland Museum, and our primary partner is the USC Shoah Foundation, um, which was founded by Steven Spielberg after he made Schindler's List in 1994. So the Shoah Foundation, the USC Shoah Foundation, um, has the Visual History Archive. This is home to 55,000 testimonies, um, not only about the Holocaust, but also looking at the Rwandan genocide, um, Guatemalan genocide, and most recently, the Rohingya genocide. Um, of course, now it is not officially listed as a genocide, but um, UN officials says it will be investigated as one. Um, and in the coming months, there is a project where we will collect 100 um, 100 testimonies, and yes, this is like very exciting. It's a new addition to the Visual History Archive, and part of this project is to also index these terms, so you can go onto the Visual History Archive, <laughs> and you can search for um, any sort of topic. You can search for a theme or a place, and you can find testimony that is related. Um, also, the USC Shoah Foundation works on the eyewitness platform. This is a platform that is free to use. It's for educators, it's for students, and you can enter this platform and you can search uh, a topic that you're interested in from a specific event like the Holocaust to the topic of empathy, for example, and you can find activities that are related. Um, I will talk more about eyewitness later on, and also tomorrow I will be leading two eyewitness activities um, and through, through these, students are able to sort of connect testimony to something in the classroom. So we have educators that created all of these programs, um, and then they're using these that match their national curriculum, so that way students are able to learn from testimony in the classroom. Uh, the USC Shoah Foundation also, it's connected to USC, which is a university, so there's a lot of research that's happening there. Um, conferences and different research about the impacts of genocide, um, and we're doing also outreach to universities there. So back to what Zahor is doing. Um, we're doing educational programs for teachers. So one of them is the Teaching with Testimony program of the USC Shoah Foundation, where we're inviting teachers to come for a week to Budapest, and then they're, over the next year, they're creating their own program for their own classroom to use with their students. Um, we also do one to three day seminars where we're teaching teachers how to use the eyewitness platform. And this is a great way, not only for teachers to get tools, but also for us to get feedback about what sort of materials are teachers looking for in the classroom, what do their students need, what is resonating with them. 
And finally, uh, we have our iWalk program. So an iWalk is a visit to a location that integrates survivor or witness testimony. So what it's doing, it's connecting the history, historical location and an event through testimony. Um, and they can do this physically by walking to a location with one of our student guides that I mentioned earlier made this book. Um, so they can physically visit being led with a guide and you take tablets and you go there. You can also um, go on our app. So if you download the iWalk app, you can go, for example, in Budapest, and you can, with your app, look at a testimony and also be asked questions. And this is something that we target for student groups. So student groups are coming and being led on these iWalks and also as an individual, so the general public can use these. So the impact is cognitive, effective, and moral. So a lot of Holocaust education is just focusing about the past. This is not what we believe in. We believe that these testimonies and the past can teach us about today, that they're answering bigger questions about how you would feel, uh, and questions that are important for students to situate themselves. Also, importantly, topics that are so big like this, uh, they can feel very far away. So for example, for a lot of students, when they think of the Holocaust, they think of Auschwitz. They don't think of the house right next door where this woman lived and where she has her own story. So this is a way to really bring students close to a cause. So the outcomes we have seen are really, really great. Um, they're allowing more critical thinking. They're allowing students to ask questions that are larger than just understanding what happened in the year 1944. These are bigger questions about what does it mean to be a bystander? What does it mean to stand up for change? How, how can I actually be involved in that process? And for a lot of students, um, this is their first time understanding that any violence towards Jews happened in Hungary. So again, a lot of students are taught that this is something that happened in Auschwitz. This is something that happened very far away. Um, so this is something that students are surprised to know that this has something to do with their personal history, with the neighborhood that they live in, with the pub that's across the street from their house. Um, and this is partially due to also the power of testimony. Um, so I can show you a little, a little peek into what our iWalks look like. So we have one that's focusing on Jewish culture and looking at Hungarian Jews through the period of time, and it's in the Jewish district. And this Jewish district formerly was the ghetto area for Jews living in Budapest. Um, and today, this is the party district. So we found it really important to say, okay, the Jewish district today, it's not just a place to go party. It's also a place that has a real vibrant history. Um, also, we have another I walk that takes you to the Danube Bank. Um, there were many Jews that were shot into the river by the Arrow Cross, which was the Hungarian Nazi party. Um, and so this walk is focusing on this location and also talking about the history of monuments in Hungary, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, specifically this living memorial, which I think got some pretty big attention. Um, based off of the success of I walks in Hungary, in Budapest, teachers from smaller villages in Hungary and smaller towns also wanted to share, uh, and they wanted to include include their towns where most Jews perished. Um, so we've developed, m with the help of these teachers, developed many more iWalks and are currently developing more. And also based on this response, we're developing them regionally. So just last week, two weeks ago, I was in Romania developing an iWalk in a small town um, called Shimleu, uh, where there are currently no Jews left, but it used to be uh, more than 60% Jewish. <coughs> So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Hungarian context. I'm doing okay with time. So of course, I can't give a full historical lesson about Hungary, uh, but I'm going to do my best. And afterwards, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. So probably one of the most important things to highlight is the presence of Jews and the life of Jews before World War II. Often when we talk about Jewish community or culture or life, we start with World War II. Um, but in Hungary, it was a very particular case. So actually, the Jewish synagogue in Budapest, if any of you have been there, and I showed in this 
one of these last pictures, it doesn't really look very much like a synagogue. Actually, it looks nothing like any other synagogue in the world. This is because the Jews of Hungary were very unique. They were assimilated. Uh, they were celebrating Christmas. They were interacting with their Christian neighbors. There wasn't very many differences between the Jewish community. Um, and this, this is something that also happened because Jews were emancipated, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, Hungary recently celebrated that. So Jews were a major part of life. They were developing businesses. Um, they were involved in the city. There was no real separation. Um, this sort of shifted after World War I. So Hungary lost a lot of land after World War I. Um, before it was greater Hungary, and now it's, it's just Hungary. This is still something that um, is painful for Hungarians today. We call this Trianon syndrome um, for the Trianon uh, clause that had Hungarians lose the land, lose what they saw as their land, and sort of spread Hungarians out. So, you know, there are Hungarians in Romania, for example, that would still identify today as Hungarians, and there's large movements today also that would take back the land that was lost in Trianon. So this was a great trauma for Hungarian society. And so because of these losses, uh, the Hungarians were the first country to pass anti-Jewish laws, copying these Nuremberg laws, um, and they were quickly allies with Germany, who promised Hungary that if you ally with us, you'll get your land back. So this was a great motivation for Hungarian government to align with German government. Um, this was also one of the reasons why Jews were in Hungary were the last to be deported. So Jews living in Poland, for example, were deported much earlier. Jews in Hungary were only deported in 1944. Um, however, because of how late Jews were deported, uh, this, this does not mean that they were treated somehow better than other Jews in other countries. In fact, uh, the Nazis said that they were so surprised at how swift the Hungarians were at exterminating the Jewish population, so much so that they had to build special graveyards in Auschwitz specifically for Hungarian Jews. Um, so this was very severe. Um, and in the Hungarian countryside, you had around a 10% chance of survival if you were a Jew uh, at this period. And in Budapest, it was more like 50% because Budapest was the very last um, place to be targeted based on the protection of the Hungarian government. Um, then afterwards, b the Soviets liberated Auschwitz and they invaded Hungary. Um, and so we have this long communist period in Hungary. And during this time, there was really an assault on Jewish memory of the Holocaust. Rather, the focus was this was a Hungarian, this was a fascist uh, group that was targeting Hungarians. So under communism, of course, religion was not supposed to be present in people's lives. Um, but rather, it was about modernizing or making it Hungarian, this trauma and this loss. And, uh, you know, the anti-Zionist, anti-cosmopolitan sentiments also, you know, trickled into anti-Semitism there. Um, and this was about condemning, condemning Nazis and praising Soviet liberators. So back to this idea of memory. There's a strong narrative of victimhood in Hungary. So after the liberation from the communist regime, it's actually written now in the Constitution of Hungary that Hungary's society should act as if it were beginning again after 1944, so that we should forget everything that happened, the communist occupation. This should be a forgotten part of Hungarian history and rather begin uh, in the Horti era of 1944. So Horti was an admiral of Hungary. He was majorly responsible for the deportation of Hungarian Jews. So you can already see how this is a bit problematic that they're saying uh, in the Constitution that we would like to begin from his leadership. So um, this, this idea of victimhood is really positioning Hungarians as a whole, as victims, purely. Um, this means that there's a, a sort of policy on non-accountability. So it's not that Hungarians were involved in the persecution of Hungarian Jews or that they were involved in the persecution of Hungarian Roma but rather that it was occupation of communists, occupation of Germans that led to this. Um, so I have a picture 
Um, this, it says Nem Nem Shoha, it's from Trianon. This is like something that you can still see it today, that no, no, this never happened. It's not over, we can still get our greater Hungary back. Um, below is the House of Terror. Um, in this museum, they're just talking about that Hungarians were victims to both of these occupiers. Um, again, this sort of policy on non-accountability. Um, there's a bust also of Horti. This is in front of, it's nearby parliament. Um, so yeah, very problematic figure. There are many busts of him all over Hungary. And below, we have this uh, monument of the German occupation. So this was erected three years ago at this point. Um, it is very, very large. Uh, you can see the German eagle. This German eagle is attacking the Archangel Gabriel, which represents Hungary. Um, Germany was obviously very upset about this monument because they're still using the eagle today. But more importantly, the local Jewish community was <laughs> very upset by it because, of course, there were Hungarian collaborators in the Holocaust. They were the ones that carried out the orders. They were the ones that went further than the orders. Um, so this is sort of erasing, um, erasing the history that actually happened. And there were protests and police. And I can I will talk about that again in a second. Um, so I want to talk about Holocaust education in Hungary also. So this is. Holocaust education in Hungary is very new. Um, so during the communist period, there was, there was no discussion about the Holocaust in Hungary. In the 1970s, you saw some people publishing their or oral histories. This was sort of a beginning, a, a new beginning, but there was nothing uh, institutional or governmental about this, uh, about, about these oral histories. Um, this only happened later on. So. Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day, was, or Holocaust Memorial Day was introduced in 2001. This was definitely a huge step. It meant that one day a year, there had to be some sort of education on the Holocaust. Um, and it didn't say what the Holocaust education should be, just that one day a year, there should be something. Um, then there were also major changes in 2012. So it may sound shocking, but prior to 2012, uh, history textbooks did not say the word Jews in Holocaust education at all. They did not say the word Roma. It just said Hungarian victims. Um, so there was this erasure about who exactly were the victims, who exactly were the perpetrators. So 2012 also made a sort of new curriculum. Now the curriculum does say written down that Jews were persecuted in the Holocaust and Roma were persecuted in the Holocaust. So th this was really important. Um, in 2014, this was the Holocaust Memorial Year. This was also a, a great shift in Hungary. Um, it also, again, it meant that there were more programs, but not necessarily what these programs were. Um, and also, you know, no real resources for teachers about what they should do. Uh, the focus was on content. So the students should know in what year which happened, uh, in what year were the Hungarian Jews deported, and th this was sort of the end. So we saw that there was an increase in, in this actual context education, but not any change in how Hungarians felt. So this brings me to talking about xenophobia today in Hungary. Um, a recent study showed that over 30% carry anti-Semitic attitudes. Today, the largest, uh, devil group, <laughs> this is actual word used by Hungarian officials, is George Soros, who's the devil. He's not to me, to Hungarians. <laughs> um, and the most hated group are immigrants. Um, despite the fact that there are very few immigrants in Hungary, they are seen as the number one enemy. And after that, you have the Roma and the Jews. Um, we also have Jobbik in government. They're an openly racist party. Uh, currently, they have around 11 to 13 percent uh, support, but it, it fluctuates all the time. Um, so below, I have two propaganda posters that were put out during the refugee crisis. Um, this was, of course, propaganda by the Hungarian government. Um, it says, Brussels wants to bring so many Hungarian immigrants to Hungary that it would be like a small town of immigrants. Uh, this is, of course, not the case. <laughs> okay, and below maybe, yes, maybe you can see it. So 
Uh, on the left, these are a chart sort of how Hungarians feel about people in society. The green at the tippy tippy top, this is how Hungarians feel about immigrants. It's changed our positive feelings about immigrants. So it, on the left hand side, you can see, okay, it's really small, but there's, you can see some green, some green there. There were some people that had positive feelings about immigrants. After this whole propaganda billboard campaign, you can see on the last bar on the right, it actually doesn't, the green doesn't exist. So it was a very successful campaign um, where Hungarians were convinced that there's nothing good about immigrants and that they're, they're dangerous to Hungarians today. So this brings us back to our pedagogy. So we saw that teachers weren't really given what they needed in the classroom. We saw that what education existed, it wasn't really doing enough to actually change the attitudes of the people in society. So this brings us to testimony. So testimony brings a face to the suffering and to the past. So it's, it's nothing abstract. When you watch a testimony, you can see this was someone's grandmother. This was someone's friend. She's talking about what happened to her sister. So you really can get this feeling. And it's, especially for students, much easier to relate uh, when you can see a face. And they can say, oh, you were just a school child when this was happening to you. I'm a school child now. That I can't imagine if I were in your position. This also allows them to think critically um, about tolerance, about justice from an individual perspective, which is inspiring also for them because if this can affect just one person uh, and one person was able to do something, then also the student is able to feel, oh, I can also do something. Um, we're sort of focusing on two main theories. One is critical race theory, um, just acknowledging that there are, are powers in society. Not everyone is given the same amount of power um, and that individuals have more than one identity that are able to be heard. Um, and through this, we empower counter narratives. So through critical race theory, we see, okay, we know that society has one narrative it would like us to see. So instead, we should empower counter narratives. So in, empower the voices of the marginalized and those that are often not focused on in the larger narrative. And the other is constructivism. So essentially acknowledged that people base what they know off of what they know. So if you, you're learning based off your own context, your own past. And this is why all of our programming um, has students consider what they already know first, collect new information, and build something new and communicate with their friends. This way they're able to get a, a bigger educational experience. And I wanna close by talking about the impact of this work. So um, currently, these statistics are based off of US research findings. We're also doing um, research now in Hungary with classrooms. So we're taking these uh, eyewitness activities to classrooms and seeing what the difference in the outcomes are for students who get this testimony-based education versus non-testimony-based education. Um, but we know that students have a decrease in stereotypes afterwards. Um, decrease in thinking that they're true and that they're more likely to understand someone from a different background. So yes, this is very powerful. Um, students are also increasing their research skills, their critical thinking skills, um, and also that they want to stand up for themselves. They want to, uh, they want to be treated fairly. They understand what this means. Um, and this was really powerful that 94% believe that testimony allowed them to connect themselves to someone else's life. So essentially that these activities can teach students empathy. Um, also, this you know, research showed that uh, they learned the power of hate speech, which is a huge problem in Hungary today, uh, finding that most, most young people are actually receiving their news from propaganda sources, um, which of course, go along with hate speech. So important that they can understand, okay, this is hate speech. And the most astounding sort of results are that students are actually wanting to stand up after this. So they're in experiencing these activities and they're saying, okay, now I wanna do something that will make the community a better place. Um, and this, this to us is the point of education and, and specifically of remembering, so. Yes, this is the end of my presentation, but I'm excited to answer all of your questions afterwards. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, uh, before introducing uh, our second speaker, uh, I forgot to tell you that there was going to be a third speaker, Kate Turner, uh, with the title of Healing Through Remembering uh, from Northern Ireland, but she could not, unfortunately, come because of her illness, because of health problems. Uh, so, um, we have um, Tom Pessa from Zohrot, and Gillian explained how Zohrot, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but uh, Zahor uh, come from the same roots, and so it's inter interesting coincidence, as Gillian said. Uh, Tom Pessa, is, uh, his title is Zohrot Discussing Nakba and Return in Israel. Uh, he is currently a board member of Zohrot. He participated in the organization's activities since its founding in 2002 and helped organize the third return conference in 2016. Pesa obtained his PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley in 2014 on the topic of settler colonial societies and their discourses regarding the cleansing of indigenous groups. And this year, Pesa presented a series of lectures in Zohrot on Zionism and settler colonialism. He has also written several pieces on Nakba and returned for online magazines in Israel and the US. And his presentation, um, is about, uh, I think, Zohrot, which has the aim, it's an Israeli NGO, uh, is, its aim is to open up discussion among Israeli Jews on two main issues. The Nakba, uh, which is the 1948 expulsion of most of the Palestinian population from what became the State of Israel, and return, uh, the redress of this expulsion by enabling Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. The, uh, and his presentation focuses on Zohro's activities, conferences, lectures, tours, film production and screenings, games, exhibitions, original materials for teachers and more. And so he's going to discuss uh, the impact of this NGO, Zohrot, and some of the uh, challenges it faces. So the floor is yours, Tom. Can I first introduce Mrs. Gatz? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, first of all, I wanted to really thank the Herandink um, Foundation for hosting us. This has been really great. They've been very generous and it's, it's really um, exciting and inspiring for us to hear about all your work. Um, okay, uh, let me begin. Okay, I'm gonna be discussing four main issues. One, I want to uh, briefly tell you a bit about uh, how we talk about Nakba and how we talk about return and, and like the, the background for those two issues that are the issues we're trying to address through our activities. Uh, the main bulk of what I'm going to do is to tell you about um, our activities last year in 2016 as an example of the different fields we operate within. Um, a little bit at the end, I'll talk a bit about you know how how we can measure to what extent we're reaching uh, Israeli society and, and a few words about challenges we face. Okay, so zochot means uh, remembering in Hebrew. Uh, so as we said, both names of the organizations come from the Hebrew root of to remember. 
so the hot means remembering in the present and it's actually in the feminine so there's some feminist um, subtext in the fact that we, we use the, the feminine form um, we're an NGO and we aim to talk to Israeli Jews so they are our target audience and to educate them to change public opinion about two main issues which are uh, the Nakba and return uh, the Nakba being the expulsion of around 85% of the Palestinian population in 1948 um, and return being what we see as the correct, just, legal way of correcting the injustice that happened then, which is to enable Palestinians to return to their homes. Uh, so Nakba means catastrophe in Arabic. That's the, the term that became the, very, very soon, in, in 1948 itself, it already became the, the widespread name for, to describe what, what, what happened. Um, it, was, it happened during the war that led to the founding of the State of Israel. So Israel fought with, um, aft, after the declaration of the state, Israel uh, fought with four or five uh, armies from neighboring countries, but while it was um, conducting this um, conventional war, uh, it also became an opportunity to attack Palestinian villages and towns and expel most of the residents. Uh, so 11 cities, 418 villages, something like 85% uh, per of the Palestinians residing in the state, that became the area that became the state of Israel. And we have another 4% who, who, what we call internal refugees, that is to say, uh, they were displaced from their homes, they lost their property, but they stayed within uh, the area of the state of Israel. So they, they still stayed within the same country, within the same state, but they, they still see themselves as refugees because they were displaced from where they were originally. And we always emphasize that the Nakba is not an isolated event, so it isn't just a coincidence that this happened during this war, but it's part of an ongoing process which is to do with Zionist settlement in uh, Palestine and the, the, way it, uh, the way it was formed. And, and this process started off from expulsion of peasants, Palestinian peasants in the 1880s, and it continues to the present. So we still have ongoing issues with uh, communities, for example, in the south of the country or in the Jordan Valley, which you know, at the present face uh, attempts to expel them. Uh, by the state. So this isn't just a, a past issue. One of the reasons we want to raise it is because uh, given the lack of recognition, uh, that's one of the conditions that makes it possible for, for these things to continue in the present. Uh, this is just a photo. So I'm going to be talking very briefly about both these issues that I'm uh, interested and passionate about and my PhD is sort of related to. Uh, so if you want to me to expand a bit more, then please do in the Q&A, but I want to leave some time to also talk about our activities. Uh, so this is a photo from, uh, I believe, from Akka, which is one of the towns from which Palestinians uh, fled uh, during, the, uh, during the war. And you can see them, you know, with all their possessions uh, flying, uh, fleeing into the sea. Um, where they were picked up by boats and they became refugees in places like Lebanon or the Gaza. A lot of the population today of the Gaza Strip is, uh, Gaza Strip is uh, former residents of, of, say, Yaffa or places within Israel. Um, or in Jordan or in what is now the West Bank or in Syria. Um, so a lot of these places have Palestinian refugees, but really most of the Palestinian population in the world today would see themselves as refugees. So even if you grew up in the US and you're not actually living in a refugee camp, but as long as you come from um, an area which is now within the state of Israel, you'll consider yourself a refugee in some sense. Um, this is a protest, a picture of a protest. So Palestinians hold a protest to commemorate, uh, to protest against what happened, to commemorate their expulsion and the the most famous uh, symbol they use is the key. So a lot of people uh, left without all their belongings, but they took the key to what was their house and they kept the key and they passed it on through generations and the key has become the symbol of uh, remembering what had happened, remembering their original homes and demanding return. Uh, and for that reason, if you go back, I 
I started from uh, our logo. So our logo is uh, a keyhole. So we are responding to this wish to return because we we are on that land to which they want to return and we want to enable that process to happen. So that's why we have a keyhole as, as the logo of the organization. Um, something that I want to emphasize is the Palestinian identity was very much local. So it isn't just a question of returning to Palestine as, as a country, it's very much an issue of uh, you know, a certain family, the Khalidi family, was in a um, very important sort of uh, family, aristocratic family, in Jerusalem since the Middle Ages, and they, were, they held very important positions. There were judges, there was a mayor, and so on. And the Khalidi family would like to, and their, their ancestors are buried in cemeteries in Jerusalem, although some of those cemeteries are being destroyed by, by Israel. Um, and they would like to return to Jerusalem. So it's, it's really a question of returning to specific places. It isn't just a question of uh, returning to somewhere in, in, in the country. Um, and it's, it's to do with the local identity, with the local traditions. There's, there's differences in accents between different places, different traditions, and so on. Um, and this is an identity which they've held to very strongly since 1948. It isn't something that can just be negotiated away by you know, some future Palestinian leader will make everyone forget you know, their identity and their history. Uh, and without going into it, but it's also um, backed by international law, there's various, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the UN, which was passed by the UN, I think, says everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. Uh, and there was a UN resolution about uh, return and, and the category of refugees uh, applies not just to the actual original people who are expelled, but also to their families. So people still see themselves as refugees of second and third uh, generation nowadays. So that's about return. Uh, Saman Abu Sita, a very important Palestinian geographer, did a survey of the areas from which they were expelled uh, and found at the time in 1994 that something like 85% of the places where they had homes are not populated. Most of them are agricultural areas, parks, um, things like that, not necessarily places which are built over. So in principle, there isn't any technical problem. Of course, there are political opposition, but there's no technical problem in just rebuilding um, in some way villages uh, in those areas. Uh, some could return to urban areas which are densely populated by Jews, but that would just mean those areas became more mixed than they are now. Um, and as for the small minority of cases in which the original houses remain intact, uh, Zuchot, which is us, uh, we teamed up with um, Badil, which is a Palestinian NGO based in Bethlehem, which represents refugees. And we formulated this document, which you can see on our website, called the Cape Town document. This is because they went, they negotiated it in South Africa, and they met with South Africans who had, uh, they met with Archbishop Tutu, and also to people who had uh, experience of the transition. Uh, because in South Africa, they faced similar issues. A lot of the black population was displaced during apartheid and then wanted to return. So we learned from their experience. And the document provides some kind of framework for negotiations between current residents and original owners. If people live in an actual house which is Palestinian, there's all sorts of conditions where ways of, of compromising, ways in which maybe one side could own the house and the other side can continue to reside in it, like leasing it, or each side could be given compensation, uh, and so on. So there's also suggestions of how to, to solve this most issue, which is the, the, the thorniest. Um, and the document also covers repa uh, reparations and, and talks about truth and reconciliation and other uh, conditions. Uh, now, of course, the political context, you, 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 as you probably realize, is that this isn't the policy of the Israeli government. Um, I would say this isn't the policy of the current regime. So it isn't, it isn't, it's been opposed by all Israeli governments since 1948. Um, for most Israelis and Palestinians, it's hard to imagine so um, for Israelis, it's often not within our consciousness at all. We think of it as a sort of technical issue. We'll just be negotiated away by some future Palestinian leader, and it's just a question of them signing some kind of document. And it's kind of, you know, a lot of people are aware of the occupation. They may be support or be against the occupation, but at least it's something which is on the agenda. But return for a lot of 
Israelis isn't on the agenda at all. That's changing somewhat as a result of our activity, but that's, that's the context. For Palestinians, uh, it is on the agenda. It is very central, as you saw in the protest, but that doesn't necessarily mean they imagine it as an actual concrete thing that is going to happen. There's a lot of nostalgia towards what was there before 1948 and a lot of very detailed stories that are passed on from generation to generation about exactly who lived where and what it looked like. Um, but there isn't always a concretization of you know, what it would be for them to return today in 2017, given all the changes that have happened since then. So a lot of the changes that are happening as a result of our activity, as a result of Badil's activity, as a result of other organizations, is that, and there's some NGOs within Israel that I'm going to talk about soon, of, of uh, Palestinian citizens in Israel, a lot of the changes in recent years have been that people have started to think much more concretely of what return would look like, in that sense. Um, anecdotally, we brought out the book of, uh, Zohot book, brought out a book of short stories about like science fiction, what would return look like? And interestingly enough, some of the writers just couldn't imagine it. So these are writers, these are people who prof whose profession is to imagine things, and yet they came back to us and they said, you know, we, we, we can't even think what, what that could look like. So there's a real barrier um, imposed on us, and, and we think that we would need some kind of different regime, which would be more inclusive, but, w but we, you know, we, can't even, we haven't even started imagining what, what that regime would, would look like. Okay, uh, so so far I was I just talked about you know the background what we're facing. Now I want you know, the the bulk of what I'm going to say is about our activities to to say what we're doing as an organization. So the was founded in 2002. Uh, our office is in Tel Aviv. Uh, if you can remind me during the Q and A, I have a really good story about our previous office, which was also in Tel Aviv, and we had um, well I'll tell you, but it's it's an interesting story. Uh, we have eight paid staff members, uh, mostly part-time, six board members, so I'm a board member, I'm not um, paid in any way, and we sort of, you know, overview the work of the organization and help in all sorts of ways, and we have, um, like, an oversight committee which checks the budget and things like that. Um, what I did really was to... I just, I'm just basing this on our annual report, which you can also find online, and I'm just going to uh, run you through our activities in 2016, but if you want, I can tell you a bit about what we did in previous years, but it's kind of a typical sort of slice of, of, of the kinds of things we, we do. Okay, so um, in 2016, we had about 4,000 participants in various activities, mainly Israeli Jews, which who are our biggest target audience, also some Palestinian citizens of Israel, and also some internationals. Uh, we had a conference on return, which 300 people attended, which I, I helped organize. Uh, we had exhibitions and lecture evenings, which I'm, uh, all these things I'm going to talk about, so this is just an overview. We had tours to sites of uh, destroyed villages and towns. We had seminars for educators and all kinds of profession, uh, professionals. Um, courses on different subjects. We have a film festival, the early film festival, and we also had 300 people visiting our office, which also serves as an information center. Um, and we also collect testimonies there and things like that. So this is like an overview. I'm going to go through that in more detail. Uh, oh, I, I wanted to say, yeah, uh, our digital activity grew very much in 2016. We had 98,000 people on our website. Uh, we had uh, 6,000 people using our, our app, which is called iNakba. Uh, we have 10,000 followers on Facebook. Um, we also disseminate a lot of booklets and maps and books. Every time we do a tour of a destroyed village or town, we produce a booklet which has testimonies and historical evidence of what happened there, and that is, uh, we, we can send to libraries, we can give that out to people, and so on. Uh, and again, mostly, most of it is in Hebrew. Okay, so we have six programs. Uh, each one has a different staff member uh, responsible for it. Uh, one is called Space for Return, Political Education, Pre-Transitional Justice. Pre-Transitional because although the, the more well-known term is Transitional Justice, but that usually happens when there is a transition, right? So if, if the regime changes, we talk about what are the changes that are happening when the regime changes. In our case, uh, we're trying to figure out what it's like to do that before, before something has actually changed in terms of, of the grand politics. Um, 
knowledge and culture. I'll talk a bit about that. The film festival, and then we have you know a public outreach um, coordinator. Okay, so space for return that includes our international return conference, which was held in 2016 in this museum in Tel Aviv, which is um, ironic on a few levels. The museum is called the Museum of the Land of Israel. The the name is a very sort of nationalist name. It used to be run by a very, very, very right-wing Israeli politician, uh, and it's on the land of a destroyed Palestinian village called Sheikh Mohanes, uh, and we rented it privately, so that was legal, and uh, they couldn't do anything about that. Uh, we had 25 speakers, Israelis, Palestinians, some international scholars and activists. Uh, we shared with the Israeli public some of our cooperation with organizations, with Palestinian organizations, because basically a lot of what we do is to work with these organizations and then disseminate the knowledge to the Israeli public, so they're very important for us. Uh, these include Badil, uh, which is an organization in Bethlehem which represents refugees. Uh, ADRD represents internal refugees. So I was saying before, there's some people who stayed within the state of Israel, they are Israeli citizens, and yet they were also displaced in 1948, so there's an association which represents them. Baladna is, is a youth group. Uh, it means our country in Arabic, it's a youth group, and they also do all sorts of activities which help people uh, imagine or prepare for, for return. Uh, we had international presentations by uh, Selma Probovic is from Bosnia, and she talked about return of refugees to Bosnia after uh, the war there. Um, the second person is from Rwanda. Also, there was a uh, return of Tutsi and, and other kinds of refugees to Rwanda um, after the Rwanda genocide there. So we're trying to draw inspiration from other countries because this issue of refugees being displaced and wanting to return isn't unique to, to us. Um, yeah, so this is this is where we held it. We conducted 10 open tours, so almost every month uh, we conduct a tour to one of the destroyed villages or towns, which anyone can come to. We had about 500 people. Uh, usually um, we locate some refugee who was from that place, because as, as I said, a lot of the refugees stayed within the state of Israel, so they are not in the original location. They may be you know, in a town which is, say, half an hour away from there. So it's, it's not that hard to locate. And, and obviously, these people are quite old at this point. And they take us on tour, and they say, uh, this is where what looks to like an empty field was the village. This is where my childhood home was. This is where a mosque was. This is where a church was. This, is, this was a cemetery. And we can sort of recreate the area. And of course, we record that by, by video, because these are very important testimonies. Um, and we bring out a booklet every time that happens with the testimonies with historical information, so that helps um, sort of record the memory of, of each place. Um, we also had, specifically in that year, we had this apology ceremony, so this is a slightly different kind of practice. Eric Adler was the son of um, what we call right righteous Gentiles. These are um, non-Jews who saved Jews during the Holocaust. So his father saved a lot of Jews in the Netherlands, and um, the Jewish National Fund said they were going to plant a forest in his name. Uh, so initially, that sounded like a very nice way of, of you know, uh, respecting this person who had helped the Jewish people. Except that the Jewish National Fund are also a very sort of colonial organization within Israel, and they plant forests on top of destroyed Palestinian villages in order to cover up the memory. So when this person found out what had happened, we organized an apology ceremony. He's the son of the person um, wh whom the, the uh, forest is named after, and he apologized to the residents of Beit Natif uh, for you know, taking inadvertently taking part in the destruction of their village. So that's, that's something a bit different. Uh, we also have uh, on demand, you know, you can contact Zohot and ask for, you know, to, to, to tailor a, a, a tour specifically for your group and say, you know, what you're interested in and so on, and, and we do that. So this is a picture of one of the tours. We always bring signs in three languages, uh, English, Hebrew, and Arabic, for, and these say, you know, the cemetery, the school, and so on, and we, we put them in the original locations of where these things were, and this is very symbolic because 
within a few hours after the tour, people always take the signs away. So there's a very strong opposition to commemorating this in, in any way, but at least sort of symbolically we, we do it during the tour. And this is um, the person who coordinates these tours, uh, these tours is uh, Omar al Rubari, who you can see on the right hand side, and he's interviewing a refugee from 1948. So this is what it looks like. And she's telling the story, and then people around are, are witnessing her, her testimony. Uh, we gave, we organized, Space for Return also organized different lectures. So for example, a lecture on Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, which was to coincide with Israeli Independence Day, because that is when we commemorate Israeli independence, when Jew Israeli Jews commemorate Israeli independence, Palestinians uh, commemorate the Nakba, so that usually goes together. And we did a tour of Dir Yassin, which is the, fam the site of the most famous massacre of 1948. There were several massacres that took place then uh, through their testimonies by refugees. Okay, so so far this was one area, which was space for return. Now I'm going to talk about political education. Uh, political education means for example, we do a course for professionals who, who are planners. So they use their professional tools um, to think of what return would look like. This is a way of concretizing what return would look like, and, and we ask them to focus on return to Haifa, which is a city in the north, which was very, very central to Palestinians before 1948. And they have all sorts of tools for eliciting requests from the public and turning turning them into actual planning programs so they try to do that uh, with people who plan to return and then to ask you know how would that fit in with the current urban structure of Haifa today uh, we had a game lab we, we create political games so we had also some people like game students and game players and parents um, come and help us design games and we give a small fund to help produce those games and uh, try to get them to be developed commercially and then actually to have them, um, and I'll give you an example in a minute, uh, so people actually, you know, play them and that will be part of their, their education. Uh, and we also, we did different courses, like there was the creative writing workshop on the Nakba where people learn to write stories or poems or whatever. I did a course on Zionism and colo col colonialism, uh, which gives you a sort of background for what happened. There was another course on Palestinian women, history, and memory. So this is a newspaper report about one of our games, which is called Terraces. So the Palestinian villages, um, some of them, for example, on the way to Jerusalem are built on a slope, and there are terraces uh, where they cultivate um, what they do agriculturally, and this, this is you recreate the village and you also, I mean, it's to do with the village being destroyed but also the village being recreated. I, I can't tell you exactly the rules of the game because I haven't played it, but that's the idea. And it's it's made out of wood and it's, it's um, the pieces are very beautiful, very nicely designed and it's supposed to be prepared for commercial production uh, soon. Um, we have a curriculum on transitional justice for high school teachers uh, so they can add this curriculum to what they're teaching and, and um, they learn different examples from the world of what transitional justice looks like. So for example, the Peace and Reconciliation, if, you, if, if you've heard of the Peace and Reconciliation um, Committee in South Africa where they heard testimonies of what happened during apartheid. Uh, so there's all sorts of examples like that all over the world of learning about the past towards some kind of reconciliation and uh, justice. Uh, so we learn about that and then we fit what happened here in, into that context. Another program is called uh, Shuruch, which is cracks in Arabic. And here, this is designed for teachers and we offer uh, additional information in relation to key things in the official curriculum. So the official curriculum does have a piece on 1948. Of course, what it teaches is mostly uh, the official um, way of looking at it, which is military confrontations between uh, the Israeli army and the armies of other Arab countries. Very little of it is about what happened to Palestinians, so we're not preventing, teachers have to teach this. If they don't teach this, they'll be fired, but they can add a little bit more material about what happened to Palestinians, right? So this is a way of sort of um, getting into a bit into schools and into what is being taught to students without uh, 
confronting directly without preventing people from teaching the state curriculum, which is, is, is you know, too dangerous for, for teachers. Uh, and then we train people uh, how to use the materials and we have seminars for them, we meet them, we email them, we have phone conversations, so we have our coordinator is in contact with, with them to try and implement these uh, materials. Yeah, that's the, the front cover of this, uh, of this program, which is Shruch, uh, Cracks in History. Okay, so this was the second program. Now we're on to the third program, uh, pre-transitional justice. We have uh, a group which implements all sorts of grassroots ideas for how to, all sorts of projects of pre-transitional justice, like research remains um, in your area, obtain testimonies from Jewish fighters in 1948. So of course, you know, it's important to record the testimonies because these people are now, at the very least in their 70s, probably in their 80s. Um, research archives and so on. So we had also people, you know, developing, you know, people from the public, general public, developing ideas like that. Uh, they collect all testimonies from Palestinian refugees and from Zionist uh, fighters who fought in 1948. There was a truth commission. So we had a public hearing where we talked about what happened in the South during 1948 to 1960, because in the South, oh, okay. Uh, in the South, expulsion, so I'm, I may go slightly over the time. Uh, in the South, expulsions happened also after 1940, in a lot of places, in the South especially, there were many Bedouin communities who were driven out during the 1950s. So we had, sorry, this is what it looked like, people speaking publicly. This was in Beersheba, which is in the South of the country. So we also tried to spread out our activities. And in the end, they produced a report with all the testimonies and so on. Uh, knowledge and culture programs, so we have exhibitions in private homes. We managed to contact some of the people who live currently in Palestinian houses, and some of them were willing to open their houses and have exhibitions in those houses by artists. Uh, and then we organized like a week of, of exhibitions where we also have um, tours and plays and things like that. Uh, and we also have book launches on, on um, issues related to this. One of them was held in El Arakib, which is very important because El Arakib is a Bedouin community which is currently being displaced by the government. So having the exhibition there, having the, the symposium there was a way of protesting the expulsions and, and sort of tying people, helping people resist and, and tie themselves to, to the land. This is an example of one of the, this is an old Palestinian home in, in, in Jaffa, in Jaffa, and you can see people, this is an exhibition, you can see people uh, you know, participating. Uh, okay, the film festival, we have every uh, film festival three-day program in the Tel Aviv Cinematheque, and then we screen films over the, during the year in Haifa and in Jerusalem, and then we have discussions with the filmmakers, and we even have a festival in New York, so these, these films travel um, to other places. Uh, we also help to produce several films, so short films, we give a fund to the, uh, small fund to the filmmakers, and we follow up with them, we help them with, with ideas and resources and things like that. Uh, this is a great film, 10 minute film uh, by my friend Daniel Schwartz, who is a uh, uh, cinema um, student. He won several prizes in, in festivals and, and she, she interviews her grandparents. There's a, a mirror in their house which was looted in 1948 and she interviews them about the source of the, the mirror and where the mirror came from and how, how they feel about that very, very touching film. Um, yeah, and finally, the public outreach program. So we have a website with a lot of materials, which you're, you're welcome to visit, www.zohort.org, I think. Uh, we had 98,000 users, so this is, this is very accessible to people. We have an app where you can go to former Palestinian localities and you can see materials on what was there, photos of the buildings, testimonies, and so on, and you can add add materials to that, upload materials to that. So this is what the Ayn Akba looks like. Um, we have a Facebook page, which also responds. So when something happens, you know, we try to bring, you know, historical context. We have a visitor center at our offices. We have a newsletter. Um, people can come to visit the center and, and, and get more material. Okay, uh, finally, I want to say two words about overall impact and challenges. So I, I'm done with covering our activities. I want to say 
see how long I have. Ah, that's me. Okay. Um, this is a small graph representing uh, Google searches for the word Nakba in Hebrew. So the word Nakba wouldn't be used in Hebrew before the whole started working. Uh, until then, obviously, Palestinians were using it a lot, but not, not Israeli Jews. So on the left-hand side, you can see the end of the 90s, where it's something like 10 or 20. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, 2015, which is 7,000. So that's a huge rise in the use of the word Nakba, which shows you that it's, it's infiltrating you know, Israeli discourse. Uh, and that is mostly because of our activity, because there isn't any other NGO in Israel which is, is working on this issue vis-a-vis -vis Israeli Jews. Okay, final, uh, final slide. Thanks for, for your patience. Um, I get asked about you know, what challenges we're facing with, with, with this, this agenda. So first of all, it's important for me to say that most of the Chot staff are you know, the most privileged group within Israeli society, right? Most of them are Israeli Ashkenazim, Jews from Western Europe, Eastern Europe, um, some Palestinians, some Mizrahim, like myself, uh, Jews from the Middle East, but altogether we're not the most oppressed group in, in the society today. I mean, Palestinians in the West Bank are very likely to go to jail for political activism, so much more likely than us. Palestinian citizens of Israel also face all sorts of threats from the security forces. Uh, Ethiopian Jews face a lot of police brutality, so this is not the case for us. So overall, we can take advantage of a relatively privileged position. Having said that, the government isn't completely happy with our activities. So our activities and the activities of organizations like us. So in 2011, um, they passed a law saying there can be no government funding for any official organization that commemorates the Nakba. Uh, so that means we have to be careful with who we work with and how we work with them. 2016, uh, they passed a law saying associations must report funding from a foreign government. So, of course, that was the case in the first place. But, uh, and, and we are a transparent organization, and you can see all, all our funding um, on our website. But they require that every time we publish something, we have to say we are funded by a foreign government, and that is, you know, in order to incite against us and stigmatize us as some kind of foreign agents, which is what they, they claim. Uh, we have constant threats and harassment from all sorts of government ministers. For example, the current Minister of Culture, Re Miri Regev, every time, very often when we have an event, we had a film festival two weeks ago, which we tried to get that cancelled. Today, this morning, there was a screening in Haifa of one of the films, which we tried to get that cancelled as well, and that creates a lot of noise. Um, teachers sometimes face all sorts of threats for using our materials. Sometimes there's some individuals, we have some people on our mailing list who try to literally, every time we publicize an event, they try to con the or, uh, contact the organizers and try to cancel the event. But I want to say it isn't that bad. Uh, in some ways that's uh, a blessing because it creates a lot of attention. Uh, the government law that talks about the Nakba taught all of the Israeli population what the Nakba was. I mean, it, it framed it differently than what we, we would use it, but it still brought the information to the Israeli public and creates discussion. When Minister of uh, Culture Regev tried to cancel this event in Haifa, it created opposition. The mayor of Haifa said he was against it, and they asked for the court's response, and then the newspaper said, you know, we are trying to further the issues of Nakba in return. This is why we're doing it, and so on. So it, it also creates a space for us, in a sense. So it isn't, it isn't all bad. Uh, okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will just say a few words on the presentations that my um, response to them, and then we will move on to questions. Uh, I think the two uh, presentations were very interesting in terms, first of all, um, how they, the whole project is themselves are located in, in difficult positions because um, uh, like, uh, like Jillian's, um, in when I was introducing her, Jillian was saying that she went to a place where her uh, family was persecuted. So to work from memory in a place where your family is uh, persecuted, doing accomplishing memory work is already itself difficult. And in uh, Tom's case, 
it is like working in Israel, but in metaphorically in an exile position because uh, it is also uh, very difficult, I guess, to embrace the term Nakba, uh, which the uh, Palestinians use for catastrophe and work as an Israeli Jew um, for the memory work. So it is, it shows us, I think, um, the complications and the fragility uh, of the projects and also the p how important they are uh, in terms of fighting against the fragility uh, and uh, the contestation of memories. What I thought hearing uh, about the presentations uh, that there are different levels and dimensions of memory work um, and dealing with difficult past. One has to do with the temporal differences because all these projects are dealing with events in the past on the one hand, like one is referring to 1948, the other is uh, to uh, the atrocities and the massacres and the genocide, again, uh, 1940s. So it is, uh, has a historical character, it has its historical, historical event, which, is, um, which seems to be a finite event. That's one level. But then there is another level uh, that is the, has to do with the present and, um, and how the sites, the specific sites, already are influenced by many changes by, um, and is populated with different people, with different um, groups. And so how to deal with the past and the present is one question. Uh, that appears, that emerges in these presentations, but also how to deal with the specific sites, because the specific sites I see are very important, like the Palestinians want to go back to their specific villages. So it's nothing abstract. And also in Budapest, it's the, e, the history has its uh, traces in the urban site. Uh, but on the other hand, these issues have uh, uh, other um, significations all around the world, like people talk about Palestinians, the Palestinian memory, and also the Holocaust or whatever term we embrace, Shah. Um, so they also have different, involve other actors in different locations, and they also may be claimed uh, to talk about these memories. And my question would be, how to bring all these dimensions, and they're also, sorry, uh, the dimension of imagination, which is very interesting that you brought up. Like, it's not only past and the present, but also the future. How do we imagine the future? How can we visualize? How can we uh, make the future, um, uh, even imagine, of course, before making? Um, so I would like, bring all these together in the concept of um, Amar al-Hattan, uh, there's a film director, um, Palestinian film director, Omar al-Hattan, you know him? He has written a piece on, in, in a book called Nakba, Memories, and he has this beautiful concept, fertile memories. Uh, fertile memories is like more a uh, feminine understanding of memory in a way, I, as I see it and as also he puts it. So it is um, not to be oppressed by the past, but uh, to bring out something for the present and for the future and how to make it going on because they are fragile memories that can easily be um, challenged. Challenge is a very uh, light word. They can be attacked. They can be threatened by nationalisms, by all kinds of forces that are in power. And uh, so how to keep up fertile memories? What forms can we give to them? So we've heard lots of very creative uh, examples, very persistent. Uh, I think it, uh, we have a lot to learn from the examples. Um,